I guess I'll, yeah, I can start it. <laughs> well, welcome everybody uh, to whatever this is that we're starting. Um, so you think you can grad school? We thought that was a, a catchy name. My name is Dustin Herodin, and I'm a grad student at the U of I. I'll be one of your co-hosts, I guess. Uh, the other co-host will be Kate. She's right there. Hi guys, I'm Kate. <laughs> um, so, and some of you might know me as Kathleen if you know me from my Cornell days or my Brigham and Women's Hospital days. Um, but I'm the other co-host. Um, just to address an initial potential concern, I'm not currently a grad student. I'm going into grad school, and so I see my role as co-host as like talking a little bit about how pre-grad school I've integrated things, and um, we'll get into more later, but. Just to you know, address that at the get go. Like, I'm not telling you how to be a graduate student. <laughs> That's more like Dustin and I are helping with tools. And I'll do my best to help with being a grad student. I have been a grad student for some time, um, so I am a fifth year graduate student at the U of I, um, and so it's it's been a while. And I think one of the reasons why. I, I've done workshops like this in the past for other students at the U of I uh, who were coming into the clinical community program. Um, some of it has focused more on R and getting introduced to that, but I had a, a whole time just speaking about different tools in the way that we do research. Uh, over the years that I've been involved, I think I've really realized that a lot of the things that we do, we inherit from advisors or we inherit from previous project coordinators or grad students or whoever. Uh, and a lot of times it's outdated or it's just inefficient. Um, so a lot of grad school I've spent working on trying to identify ways in which we could do better at what we do. Um, some of the tools that we'll talk about later on just to, to make your life a little bit easier. Grad school can be hard, um, but it doesn't have to be for, for these things. and we'll talk a lot about different tools and techniques that can be helpful. Um, and full disclosure, these are things that I've found helpful um, or that Kate's found helpful. It's not, you take these tools and apply them however that you see fit. Um, and really the way that I've thought about this is in terms of uh, open science. And we'll talk more about what open science is and what that means. Um, but just thinking about you as a as your own collaborator in the future, and so trying to lay some some foundational uh, foundational foundation of things so that you can prepare yourself moving forward. Uh, and in a year, when you're looking back at this project that you did, you're like, "Why did I do it this way?" Um, but just setting it up so you can look back and not not hate your old self because that, that happens a lot in grad school. Um, yeah, so that was kind of my thought in, in starting this up and really trying to, to help. And Kate has been awesome throughout this process. And Kate, if you wanna talk a little bit about why you wanted to be involved. Let me unmute myself first. Yeah, so um, I'll just share my, is this, time to introduce ourselves. Um, oh, screen table. My screen is stable. Okay. So to introduce myself a little bit, um, I started out, I graduated from Cornell in 2016. And that year I worked on my senior thesis. And while I was working on that, um, you know, as you like get your introduction to resource, re, uh, into research, a lot of times you're just doing like the quickest thing to solve the most immediate problem you're having. And for me, I collected my own data. I tried to use, like for example, I had heard about Mechanical Turk and I tried to use it and it was a complete failure. Um, I, you know, tried to clean my own data. I was doing this by hand, checking it. I had no like, like process to make sure it was clean. And then I analyzed the data in SAS, which I had learned for the first time. And then as I, so I left, <laughs> Uh, college, I moved on to Brigham and Women's Hospital where I was for two years. And there I started to learn about like a few more tools and things that I was able to integrate. 
Um, a big piece of that was Brigham and Women's had a lot of money, and that's not something you have in grad school to like have access to like resources uh, for like red cap for really nice data collection, prism to make really nice figures, whatever sort of analysis software you're going to use. Um, some of the easiest point and click ones, they cost a lot of money. And so when I came to uh, Illinois, you know, we still had some resources here. But as I was trying to learn from the grad students, I found that there was a lot of free software stuff and just like ways of doing things that I hadn't thought of and things that I thought I had to do the long way and because the long way felt like it was the only way. <laughs> and so I really benefited from all the grad students. Um, in particular, Dustin has taught me a lot of tools. Um, the one I like really love and think is fantastic is which we'll get into later, but I think is a really great example is Zotero. Um, I've used that to organize how I like look at my notes. I've used it to, you know, obviously like just make citations easier at the end of a paper, but it was sort of like looking through these processes and seeing how much time I had wasted and also how much clearer using a good tool can be for like helping me think through things or um, not wasting my time and mental space on something like that. So. Um, when Dustin started talking about putting this together, I was really excited and I, you know, wanted to co-host or, you know, spread the good news about how awesome all this stuff is. So that's why I'm here and why I'm so excited about it. And so that's, that's a little bit about who we are. Um, and really the goal of this is, like I said at the top, is thinking about you're, you're all doing your own thing and you are very smart in what you're doing. And it can be really easy to do what Kate was saying, where you, you find out a way to, to manage whatever problem is right in the moment. And then it's not really sustainable, but you know how to do it. So it keeps going. Um, we want you to be able to focus your, your, power, your brain power on the things that you're interested in and not get bogged down with having to format citations for a paper or who knows what else. It, it can be frustrating, very frustrating. And grad school doesn't have to be that way. So we wanted this space to really be open. Um, Kate and I have the, the title of co-host, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't participate. If you want to participate and ask questions, this is really an open uh, and safe space. <laughs> uh, this is, these are tools where you can use moving forward and if you're like how does this work we'll spend some time on it so um like at the beginning it said we'll be recording this and this is just so either you can go back to it or other other classmates or peers that you refer to this can go back to it and still be caught up um, that was one of the things that was difficult about some of the other sessions i did where someone wouldn't be able to make it which is understandable um, but then they're a little bit behind and I don't, I don't like having to do that. Um, I don't like trying, having to leave anybody behind. Um, so we wanted to give, spend some time here. Just if you want to introduce yourself, uh, you can talk about who you are, kind of what you're, what you're up to. And let's see. Oh, I already went through that. So just some ideas on who you are, what you're up to. You can say your name, you can say where you're headed, and really things you want to learn about. Um, and just because we're people and we're living in whatever this world is right now, uh, one thing that you found either helpful, it could be academic, it could be a cool book you're reading, it could be a show that you've found, uh, something that you discovered while you were hanging out. So if you want to participate, you can do that. Uh, so go ahead, we'll kind of open it up. You can unmute yourself and, and introduce yourself. Um, I can go first. Um, my name's Anna. Um, I am headed to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst for their clinical psychology um, PhD program. Um, I kind of like so Talia introduced this um, group to me and I'm really interested in learning more about 
you know, how to transition from being an undergrad to being a grad student and, you know, trying to avoid like falling into those like, you know, those big like holes um, and kind of like trying to make it a smooth transition. Um, and one thing I discovered while sh sheltering in place, um, I think I'm like starting to learn like what, how important like having a routine is for me where like, you know, school kind of did that for me. Um, but now it's like, since I'm on my own and especially now that the semester is wrapping up, I've noticed like my sleep schedule is like maybe not as consistent as I'd like it to be. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, <laughs> is there something that you have heard about that you wanna learn more about or you're just like, I don't know what a grad student should do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, yeah, so I've, you know, I've had like other grad school panels that are very um, depressing sometimes um, mm -hmm. where they'll talk about how, you know, you kind of have to like say goodbye to like your social life and, you know, you're going to be miserable for like five years, five to seven years. And, um, but I think, or like, I think I've heard also like scary things about going to grad school, especially straight after undergrad and how that might not be a pro like something that like people recommend. Um, but since like, that's what I'm doing, you know, like try to like make the most of that. Um, so I think things like, um, you know, like what classes are like on top of like the also being involved in research, um, you know, like what it is like working with like, a PI and like, you know, mm -hmm. how that looks different from like, you know, the professors I've worked with here at U of I and stuff like that. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anybody else want to want to share or do you just want to watch these gifts that I found? That works too. Yeah, Julia. Hi, I will turn my video on for this. Hello. Um, so I am a first year student in the clinical psychology program at the University of Kansas. Um, and I worked with Kate at Brigham and Women's, so that's how I know about this group. And I think I'm interested in kind of two, learning about things in two perspectives. One is that um, I'm gonna be taking on the role of lab manager this coming academic year for my PI. And so while they have systems, some systems in place, I think sometimes things are not as like efficient as they could be in terms of just like project management and data cleaning and analysis and even just like recording the steps that people went through to kind of do all this work that then you know other students come into and they have like no context for what's going on so i think just to echo like what you both mentioned about things being sustainable in the long term not just for me as a student but for the lab would be really helpful so tools that can kind of help with that and then um yeah, I think I'm going through this struggle of like attempting to learn R and other free tools. And while the st stats program here does support that, um, I'm just open to like learning more um, and kind of making my skill set larger uh, with tools that are good for data analysis as well as data visualization. That's awesome. And um, one thing I discovered while sheltering in place. Oh, man, the birds are louder, guys. <laughs> hey, Julia, uh, just to like quick reply, I'm excited that you said that because I feel like a lot of the lab management stuff that I've struggled with or tried to, also, so Talia, who is on this call, sorry to call you out, is taking over for me. Um, so, and I took over for Dustin, sort of. Um, <laughs> And so a big thing like we've talked about in our like own conversations was like how to pass these things on and how to, um, how like lab brain works and um, making tools simpler for the people you're passing it on to, which Dustin definitely did for me and I'm trying to do for Talia. So um, I'm interested in listening to more of what Dustin says because I already learned a lot from him as well as like seeing if there are other things out there. Any others wanting to, to introduce themselves? You don't have to, this is completely voluntary. I can go ahead. 
Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Smriti. I'm a first year grad student um, at the Social Personality Program at UC Berkeley. Um, and Emily's the one who introduced me to this, and she's here. I see her. Um, and um, what I would like to get out of this, um, I mean, it's just, you know, seems like a good, I've realized that it's a good thing to always build community wherever you can. So it's nice to, you know, get together with, you know, people who are interested in the same things. I'm big on open science. You know, the first time I heard about it, I was like, yeah, why aren't we all doing this already? Um, right. So definitely, um, you know, would love to learn more about that, any tools and stuff that would be helpful. Also learning R right now. And it's been good, but you know, anything that you can put in your toolbox, um, I think it's great. Um, one thing I learned during the um, shelter in place is I actually don't mind sheltering in place. It's been kind of nice, <laughs> to be very honest. Um, and But I did discover this series on Netflix called um, The Greatest Events of World War II in Color, which is absolutely fantastic, would highly recommend it. Um, can be a little difficult to watch, but fantastic show. So highly recommend that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think... Sheltering in place has mixed things for a lot of people, and I enjoy most of it. Uh, it has been difficult to do therapy via telehealth, not something that we were really trained in. So that's been really interesting. Um, and you may hear my dog in the background. Yeah, okay. That's another thing that doing these calls, uh, you're not, or like trying to do therapy with someone and their dog jumps on them or a kid walks in without a shirt on and you're like, I don't know what to do. Um, so this is, yeah, I agree. The, these are very interesting times. Um, any others would like to, to volunteer or say something? I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, hi everyone, I'm Talia. And like Anna, I'm a senior studying psychology at University of Illinois. And starting in a few months, I'm going to be the lab manager for the Yeti Lab at U of I. So I'm excited for that. And what I want to learn, um, Dustin already covered, or, and Kate already covered Zotero. But I've been using Zotero for a few years, but I haven't been like fully using it. Like I've only been using some aspects, so I want to like, kind of master it. Um, and definitely want to learn at least a little bit of our or our studio and one thing i discovered while sheltering in place is that i can survive without caffeine like i don't actually need it because i i'm living with my grandma and like she doesn't drink caffeine and so i haven't been drinking caffeine and i don't need starbucks like i thought i did is all <laughs> I don't know what I would do without caffeine. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a four-year-old daughter and she doesn't need caffeine, but I for sure do. Um, but that's good that, <laughs> that you're able to survive without it. Miss, I miss it though. <laughs> <laughs> Any others wanna, wanna share or say something? Sure. Um, so I'm Emily. I. I'm here because Kathleen told me about this um, and I worked with her when we were undergraduates at Cornell. Um, I'm currently a first year PhD student in the clinical program at Berkeley and I want to learn more about like pre-registration and open science as well as any other like tools that would make my life easier, uh, make my science better. Um, and I've been reading a book called One Day um, while sheltering in place that I've really enjoyed. So. I guess you could say yeah, I discovered it then, so. Awesome, that's exciting. Well, welcome. Um, yeah, reading has been something that I've rediscovered. Like you can read not science articles and it's fun. <laughs> uh, others, anybody else? Um, I'll go next. My name is Lauren. Um, I heard about this through Talia and I just graduated from Northeastern undergrad yesterday. And I'll be a research technician at um, a psychology and neuroscience lab at Northeastern MGH uh, starting next month. Hoping to learn a bit more about how to make the most of my time in this post position to be um, ready for graduate school. 
Um, one thing I discovered while sheltering in place, um, I've been listening to a lot of good music. Um, I discovered that I really, really like Ari Lennox and um, Masego and Chica. So it's been really fun to listen to a lot of good music. Nice, that's exciting. And congratulations to you and everyone else who has graduated. Um, that is a huge accomplishment and should not be minimized given whatever the world is going through right now. Uh, others, anybody else? Okay. Megan? Yeah. Hold on. Megan, do you, my sister is on, on so we'll see if she. Uh, oh, hi, I'm Kate's twin sister and she will be mad if I don't introduce myself. Um, my name is Megan. Um, I am, um, I'm a teacher in Boston and I'm finishing up my master's in curriculum and teaching of English. Um, and I, I, there's some interesting places where human development stuff and um, the teaching side of things interact. And I'm doing some research with a um, really cool professor this semester and I'm interested in learning more, trying to figure out if um, research is something I wanna do. I, I know very little, only really um, just learned how to do some more qualitative um, type of research, but I'm um, excited to learn more. And um, I hope that Dustin can make fun of my sister a little bit just to make me feel like I'm at home. Uh, and uh, one thing I discovered while sheltering in place um, is that students are really bad with computers. Um, they are not good at navigating the computer. So anyone who says that they're digital natives are wrong. I agree that, yeah, a lot of the clients that I have seen or just like hearing about other people, it's very difficult. And yeah, they say that they're born with a cell phone in their hand and that may be true. They can download apps, but that's it. Um, I'll try to meet your standards on making fun of Kate. We'll see how that goes. Don't feel like you have to. Okay, we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll try to balance it. Um, and yeah, I agree that a lot of the overlap, there is a lot of overlap between teaching, human development, clinical psychology, personality psychology, social personality. There, there's a lot of overlap, and I think the underlying basis for succeeding is the same. Um, with some of the steps and hopefully some of the tools that we'll be able to talk about and learn more about. Um, so I'm really glad that there is, it's not just all clinical people, um, that there is some, some breadth and different de degrees and uh, like first year coming in, post back, kind of all over the place, which is really great um, and really exciting. So are there anybody else, I think, All right. Uh, I am usually, I'm really good with sitting in silence, uh, sometimes a little bit too long. Um, it helps in clinical settings. It helps as being a parent, but on Zoom calls when you're, uh, it, it, it can get kind of dicey. So we'll see. Um, but feel free to interrupt. Uh, the chat can be really helpful for those things, um, but feel free to to interrupt, we want to make sure that this is really helpful for you. Um, that's really the, the biggest thing. Um, and Kate, do you have, what else would you like to touch on before transitioning to our next little piece? Yeah, um, just to touch, Megan mentioned qualitative work and, um, you know, Dustin, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm misrepresenting, um, largely does quantitative work. Um, I have the most experience like data organizing and stuff for quantitative work, but I know I'm gonna be doing some qualitative work um, based on the lab I'll be entering. Um, so if that's something you're interested in or something you wanna learn more about, we can reach out to people and kind of look into resources for that as well. Um, so, you know, we might follow up with like a survey to kind of see what your needs would be. Um, and if anyone's interested in qualitative, we could maybe dive into that once we, do a little work, um, but it kind of jogged my mind as something that um, people might be doing, or if there's something that you feel like we're missing out on or a niche area, then 
you can reach out and we can look into talking about that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. There's um, the, given the, the dual nature of the PhD program that I'm involved in, there is a lot of qualitative work that's being done in the community section. Um, so there are lots of grad students here that work with qualitative data and may be helpful in, in trying to bridge that gap. That's something down the road that we want to definitely touch on. Um, so there were a lot of people that talked about open science. And I think one of the things, so we're going to talk about a lot of different things moving forward. Um, Kate, what are some of the things that we're going to be talking about? Do you want to give a, a lineup of that? Yeah, so um, the first thing, and you know, we'll touch on this today, uh, would be Twitter. So why, why is Twitter a good resource? Is it just like a place where you can make jokes and be cynical? Um, I'd say no. I think Dustin would say no. Um, and also, it can be pretty overwhelming to get into Twitter. So um, we'll go into more depth about that in a minute. But um, just to say, like, one of the things we'll also discuss is, like, how to use these tools and if you're having anxiety about it, like a brief guide into engaging. Um, so Twitter, uh, Zotero, R as you mentioned, slash R Studio. Um, a big thing we'll kind of get into is version control. If you're going into lab management slash in research in general, um, it might seem, I don't find it boring anymore uh, <laughs> because it applies to my life so much. And if you've ever had a paper where you're like, I think I edited this, and you're sorting through, um, it no longer becomes boring to you and you've squeezed your brain for like 10 hours and you wanna find that product. Um, so talking a bit about GitHub and that's you know Dustin's area of expertise. Um, under open science, we'll talk about OSF, pre-registration, sci-archive. Um, Dustin's gonna give a research resource sheet um, that he made for his students. Um, my favorite thing that I feel like I've shared with people, um, in a sort of obsessive and like, you need this, like, eh, um, is Sci-Hub. Um, and most of you guys will be a part of institutions or something, but there's always a paywall that comes up at some point in your life. Um, so Sci-Hub is my favorite thing to share with people. So that's just kind of like a sampling of some things and, um, we also want this to be organic and if you want to spend some more time on things we can do that so you know throughout this whole thing we're gonna want you guys to be open not just for science um and um communicative about what you want to know more about or what you want to spend more time on and who knows like this th this is the plan that we have right now we want it to be like kate was saying really organic and move with directions that you want to go in uh but at some point like it might be us inviting other graduate students and just talking about grad school um i think that's a, an area that in all of the podcast or recording land that i listen to um that often gets overlooked it's a lot of professors talking very high end about meta science and all these things but i think it can be really valuable to hear firsthand experiences from graduate students about things that they struggled with or things that they found really easy or how they went about navigating a certain issue. Um, I think that can be really important, especially early on in your graduate career. Um, so yeah, we'll send something out or feel free to reach out to us. We do have a, an email that you all received, so you can respond to that email. You can respond to Kate and I directly. Uh, we also started a Twitter. We'll see how, see what that looks like. Um, so you can follow us, but why don't we take a minute, we can uh, transition into talking about Twitter and research Twitter. Does that sound, sound good? I see all like, super excited faces, which is really great. Thanks, Kate. That was perfect. Um, I, there's an alarm going off in the background, so I'm going to go get that. Kate, if you want to do some intro to Twitter really quick. Yeah, of course. Okay, so why Twitter? Um, what's the benefit? Like, why engage in it? And just to kind of give a primer on why I started Twitter. So it's kind of a funny reason. When I was graduating undergrad, I saw like some people get like free shoes or like free like running gear from like having a Twitter presence. And so I falsely convinced myself that like maybe I could 
you know, post a bunch and like build up a social media profile and get free stuff. Um, that has not worked out because I don't post every day or every hour and I feel squeamish sometimes about posting too much. But what I actually found is I had Twitter for two years. I mostly used it for like talking about like learning about running and pop culture and comedy stuff. And then I came to Illinois and Dustin started talking to me about research Twitter because he found out I was on Twitter and he was like, oh, like, so do you research Twitter or something like that? <laughs> and I was like, uh, that's, that's uh, exactly how I talk. That that's not how you talk. talk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> are, you on, are you on research Twitter? Do you know about R? That, those are the two things I talk about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you had an action figure. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so I started using it and I started following the people Dustin suggested that I might be interested in following. Um, and there's like a huge list of those we could go through. And what I found is like there are like three main things that I've gotten out of it. It's, I'm not yet at the point where I've utilized it in this way, but it's a good way to promote your own work and talk to other people about your work. It's a good way to get resources um, as like, Either like you can passively, you see something that someone says has worked for them, particularly with R. Um, and it's also just like very validating. Um, I saw a lot of people talking about the grad school experience, um, as well as people discussing applying to grad school and how that was and what they got out of that. And for me, that was really helpful. And as I plan to both enter with, really enjoy, and also struggle with the challenges of grad school, I think it would be nice to have a larger community to support me and like feel like I'm not alone in that kind of work. Yeah, I think those are some, some really great points. And um, Twitter can be whatever you make of it too. You can set it up however you would like, you can follow whoever you would like. And so my, when I look at my feed, uh, it's usually a mix of comic book artists, uh, stuff about Star Wars, as you can tell behind me, uh, or things about science. And usually it's, it's R related or it's sleep related. Um, and so, or open science. Open science is a really key piece to, to Twitter. And that's where a lot of the, the more cutting edge things tend to happen. Um, so we thought it would be good to there were there's a couple things to highlight and i think kate did a nice job at, at talking about one being you can talk about your own work um so i'm gonna share my screen of something that i did um that was it was for a poster presentation um and i can talk a little bit more about what that looks like um so oh and i'm wearing the same exact sweater as i am in my profile picture that's great uh so this is something that that you can do um which can be really helpful for some some work that you've done and there are lots of different people that you can follow who do a really good job at outlining this and uh, i'll we'll send that out at the end or include it in the the notes um this was a poster that i did with kate and a postdoc that we had at the time elisa and you can see this was just a a screenshot of the poster, and then you can create an entire thread where you kind of break it down. Um, and what's really great is you can just have little bullet points or little take home messages of what it is that is important given your, your research. So if you've gone to a poster presentation, usually there is some, some spiel that they have uh, in talking about their poster and what are the main takeaways. So you can see I have just various points and someone who, who I wasn't able to go to SRP. Um, so Kate stood in front of it and I think did a good job or was it Kate or someone else? I think you had a poster at the same time. So it probably wasn't you. Me, but I liked your poster better. <laughs> <laughs> so I just stayed there. But so walking through the main points and someone who wasn't able to make it to the presentation or now this is up on, on Twitter for everybody to see forever. Um, and you can include links, you can include different, different things, you can tag people, um, but you're able to, to really explain more thoroughly some of the concepts that, that you've had. Um, that is one way to do it. A lot of other people will post about uh, 
various papers that they've read. That's another way you can post saying, I have read this paper and I found these points interesting. Oftentimes people will then tag the authors if they're on Twitter and it's a way to promote this discussion or this area. Uh, it's also a way to, to brand yourself that you are, you're connecting into a new community uh, when you transition into graduate school and you're able to really identify and see what are some things that, um, who are people that I need to be paying attention to or how can I show myself to, to this new audience um, and how will they know who I am and what I do. So that can be really useful and helpful. Um, Kate, was there something else that you wanted to touch on with, with this first part? Yeah. Um, with like sharing stuff in general. Um, I, so I used to, like, I have done less of the sharing. Um, one thing I've done is I'm a little bit selective with my likes on Twitter, um, because I use it for reference. So actually, um, Dustin and I were talking about, we were meeting earlier this week about this, and um, I was just ta asking him if he'd seen this thing on open science. So it's about a researcher who had a problem in her code. And so she had to retract one of her papers. And it was this really interesting thing and a really good example of open science. And when I saw that, I was like, I, it was in the back of my mind. And this is, and this is the tweet. Um, I had read this article and it had made a really big impression on me. And then I sort of forgot about it. So when I was telling Dustin about it, I was like, oh, you should really read this. Um, but I couldn't remember who shared it. I actually ended up following the scientist, but I didn't remember her name. Um, but I looked back through my likes and I found it within like two minutes. So it's also a good record. Um, if you want that, you can bookmark. Um, I don't think I fully utilize Twitter in the way I should, but that's another thing I'm working on. Um, so that's something I found really helpful as well. Um, and connecting myself and following people. Um, and Megan has a question. Dustin, I think you're a good person to answer it. So I'll just read it for anyone who didn't read it in chat. So she said, when you create a thread like this and make choices regarding language, who are you thinking about as your intended audience? Other researchers or more lay people who would benefit from your research? That's a good question. Yeah, I think it, it depends on um, what the, the goal of the tweet is. And so I think, in reference to the, the thread that I had done is I wanted to, to strike a balance between the two. I wanted to be able to provide information that was appropriate for a lay audience in terms of being able to follow some of the main points, um, but then also communicating to other people in the area about um, who I am and what are some thoughts that I have on this topic. So it, it seems like I always try to just strike a balance between those two. Um, and sometimes I realize that I go maybe one way or the other. Um, but I think as a whole, like as, as you start um, posting things and, and other researchers start following you, they'll start seeing this collection of thoughts and tweets that you have. And so without even meeting you, they will have a notion of who you are, which can be really helpful then when you go to a conference or when you go and you have to, you interact with this, this well-known researcher, um, that can be, can be super helpful. Uh, that they know, one, that you know how to communicate what you're talking about, not only to a scientific audience, but also to a lay audience, which I think is, can sometimes be more difficult. But this here is that, uh, are there other thoughts or questions right now about what, what to do here and what, what is Twitter? Why should I care about it? Here's the sitting in silence. Yeah, feel free to utilize the chat or, um, yeah, and we'll, we can pick it up later if you're still typing it out. Obviously, yeah. time to type. Um, but yeah, I think that's been really enjoyable to kind of see and then learn from doing. Uh, Emily, okay. So we have, in addition to Twitter, any suggestions for effectively communicating, disseminating science to peers and or a lay audience? I think that's a really good 
thing that I don't, I'm not sure the science community is good enough at um, for my initial, I'm going into grad school impression. Um, Emily, I'm not sure if you know this, I've written a public, an, an article for, um, it's called Act for Youth. So it's a website that has resources for parents. So I wrote one when I was a senior in college for, on puberty and pubertal timing. Um, and that was kind of my first uh, experience with that. Um, I would say like the positives and negatives, I, you know, spent a lot of time making it a lay um, or preparing it for a lay audience, but I also don't know what impact it had. And that's sort of what you do when you send something out to a website. Um, but yeah, Justin, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I've recently put together a website, which was where that original blog post for this was held. And I've gone back and forth with trying to, to post more readily uh, and sharing my thoughts. And I think that's a way that you can, you can do that very easily and for free. Um, so this is another plug for R, but my website was made in R uh, and published with R and GitHub. So um, that's something that we could do down the road. I think one of the other things that I found helpful is connecting with other, with mentors. Um, so there is one of the individuals in our department um, does research and assessment on a very specific population with autism. Um, so I've been able to connect with, with her and since my time in graduate school, I've been able to do two presentations for the community um, on how sleep is in ASD. Uh, so that is another way to connect that you can see how other people are doing it. Um, I think one of the, the groups that I really like is from the podcast, Everything Hurts, which this will be in our resource list because I, I really enjoy it. Um, but one of the main individuals there talked about, there's a journal where one of the reviewers is a group of, I think it's like fourth grade students. Um, so you have to be able to explain your phenomenon in such a way where a fourth grade audience can, can understand it. Or I, I can't remember what grade it is, but it's like a grade school. Um, and then it's published in their journal which is really great. So it's, there are lots of different ways in trying to disseminate your findings. Um, blog posts have become increasingly more apparent just in this field. Um, and it's a way that you can get your findings out very quickly without needing to go through peer review. And uh, yeah, there is one more resource that I uh, just remembered. Uh, there's, you could sign up for Ask a Scientist um, and I can send that link out. And that's talking to grade school kids about research. Um, and I think, you know, it could be particularly valuable. The person I know who does it, he really enjoys it. He does microbiology. Um, but I think there's a real benefit to signing up as a social scientist because I don't think a lot of people grow up knowing what psychologists who aren't clinical do or the non-clinical side of psychology. So I think that's a really good um, way to make yourself available. Um, I also coach high schoolers and um, sort of passive dissemination into the community. They ask me about things and um, always with the qualifier, like, you know, I'm learning about these things. I'm not an expert. Um, I share some things with them or like resources if they're interested. So that's been kind of fun for me. Um, I think, you know, being a community member who is a scientist can be beneficial. Yeah. And just as a whole, we as psychologists do a real bad job at translating our research. Um, that's one thing that I've noticed in, in the clinical area. Uh, we talk about a lot of stuff and what we can do, what we shouldn't do and then when it gets to treating somebody uh that's a different different story um but i don't want to make this sad and depressing so we're gonna not talk about that so stop stop that um i think one of the other things and we'll we'll share the the link to the thread that kate brought up in terms of someone retracting an uh a presentation or a, a paper paper and that was actually something that with the post that I had, um, my, that 
article or the the poster presentation I had submitted, and it was I was up for an award for uh, within the SRP. Um, and as I was putting it together after I'd submitted the abstract, I realized that something was wrong, and that the findings that I found and said were were what they were in the abstract were actually not what they were. Um, and the only way I was able to catch that and fix it was through using version control. And I was able to roll back to a previous version where I knew was good and I was able to address it. And then I wrote a letter to the, the advisory board and the committee and talked about what I found and why I did it and why I chose to proceed the way I did. So I think it can be really great to have that so that when you do make a mistake, that you can roll back and figure out what happened. But then it's also, as an open scientist, what do you do with that next step? Do you, I could have buried it and gone on and tried to publish that, um, which if I didn't have version control, I probably would have. Uh, so it's just another way to think about who we are as scientists and what we're actually doing um, and how to do it. So. Um, other thoughts or questions right now? We're kind of getting to the, the end here, so we might wrap it up with our final segment. We have segments. Isn't that exciting? It's how you know we're professionals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to say, yeah, one of the things I was really impressed by is uh, when Justin uh, talked through that. I think a lot of people make mistakes in science, and seeing like a public conversation about a mistake that someone's made and not buried um if i had to guess i would say a lot there are a lot of studies where something went wrong and it was either covered up with the best of intention sometimes or um made into a poster and then this poster is like falsely promising um so it's a when you're up for award it's difficult to say i mean i'm just really impressed with that um we can talk more about that later um there are a lot of pressures i think in academia to publish and publish positive results, of course. Um, and so I think Twitter is a really good place for that. And our open science conversations, I think are really important, especially because everyone who's in academia and who is like a big wig now will someday die. And we'll take their place, <laughs> not in a dark way. <laughs> they'll live long lives, but they'll move on eventually. And, and so it's gonna go up behind them and Assassin, an open science assassin. Um, don't, if anyone, no, you didn't hear this. Shoot, it's recorded. Um, okay, yeah, this is going out. I'm joking. Um, they're all going to live long, fulfilling lives, I hope. Um, but anyway, so. That would be the worst assassin. Like, hey, I'm going to go kill these people, and I'm going to do it this way, and it's pre-registered on OSF. <laughs> that's what I was going to say, open science. Um, that's not gonna happen. Um, if you're uncomfortable with assassination jokes, I'm gonna stop. Um, but yeah, I think it's just really great to know that like, we're starting a community now with newer scientists and that's gonna have long lasting effects and I think improve the field as a whole. So that gets me really excited. Um, and also before our final segment, um, just to say, if you know of anyone who might be interested in this um, or interested in these topics, please feel free to share with them um and oh wow good point i mean there's a pandemic going on so you might not need to i hope everyone's well um i've got to stop i'm putting myself on mute um but yeah please share our uh link or our um contact info and we can add them to our group yeah we want this to be this is totally open and no pressure this is a way where we can talk and be thoughtful about the things that we're doing moving forward. You're all very smart people and you just need to keep keep doing that and not get bogged down with the stupid stuff that sometimes comes up in grad school. Um, so now we'll take it on down to our final segment, which Kate and I thought very hard about. It's, uh, we're nerds, so this is gonna be our future directions. Um, slide our future directions where at the end of a paper you get to the discussion so we've gone through the paper we've read the results and now we're talking about future directions and it's not going to be do this in a different population or if we measured it some other way it would be better 
Uh, this is just going to be us talking about things that we've done uh, over this week. Something, it might be something we've read, something we've watched, um, just a way to show that we're humans and not grad school robots. Um, so this week, Kate, do what you started off. We started off. I've been talking a lot. Yeah, and I've been talking about violence. Um, so my thing is I've been reading a lot of Margaret Atwood and I recommend it a lot. Um, so Margaret Atwood's awesome. So I've been reading a lot of her works. Um, Fiona Apple also just came out with a new album. Um, if you're like into the Riot Girl, Liz Fair scene and old Fiona Apple, you'll also like new Fiona Apple. So I've been rocking out to that and dealing with some existential um, angst. So it's been really fun. So I guess angst is your recommendation? In these trying times, I recommend angst. Okay. All right, good. Um, yeah, I'm reading Oryx and Crake based on Kate's recommendation. So that's been a new, new addition. Um, one thing that has come up in my new reading when I've learned how to read again uh, is it's called Children of Time, and it is by... Adrian Tchaikovsky. It is a really great science fiction book, um, and I really enjoyed it. So check that out, or check out uh, Everything Hurts, the podcast. Um, yeah, Quantitude is a fun one, too. Other nerdy things. Um, yeah, anybody else want to recommend something? You can come on down into our, uh, into the future directions if you'd like. Yeah, here's your chance to get back on audio. <laughs> Wait, does it have to be nerdy? I'm offended. <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> I mean, I've been reading, um, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, which I guess is kind of nerdy, uh, but it's been great. Um, really fantastic book. And he's, you know, super funny, but also, you know, brilliant. And you can see that, so definitely a great book to some fun, you know, reading. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Everything that I recommend will be nerdy Star Wars related, which it falls under that category anyways, um, or sometimes comedy. We'll see. Which there is a new uh, improv with Middle Ditch and Schwartz on Netflix, and that is full improv. It is long form improv. So it's, they take one concept and do it for a whole hour. It's really interesting. That's fun. Mine are all going to be running or reading related. So if you don't like to run, tune out. I can, I can mute her. She, yeah, we can mute Kate when she talks about running. That's fair. Everyone does that in real life in my lab. Yeah. Wait, if comedy is game, then I also, did anybody like Scrubs the show? Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. A podcast called Fake Doctors Real Friends and I just started listening to it. I, it's it's been fun so far. So also yeah. Um, Scrubs, yeah. Yeah, Ted from Scrubs also passed Don't away uh Don't yesterday. So sad news if anyone's a Scrubs fan. Um so if you want to appreciate him, that's Fake Doctors Real Friends. I can double endorse. It's great. Does anyone have something uplifting that we can talk about instead of Kate again going on the everybody's dying i'll self-correct for next <laughs> next time okay that's a good way to end on <laughs> that there is death all around us always but we are grad students and we persist all the time no matter what <laughs>